Byzantine dress changed considerably over the thousand years of the empire, but was essentially conservative. The Byzantines liked color and pattern, and made and exported very richly patterned cloth, especially Byzantine silk, woven and embroidered for the upper classes, and resist dyed and printed for the lower. A different border or trimming round the edges was very common, and many single stripes down the body or around the upper arm are seen, often denoting class or rank. Taste for the middle and upper classes followed the latest fashions at the imperial court. As in the West during the Middle Ages, clothing was very expensive for the poor, who probably wore the same well-worn clothes nearly all the time. This meant in particular that any costume owned by most women needed to fit throughout the full term of the pregnancy on the body. In the early stages of the Byzantine Empire the traditional Roman toga was still used as very formal or official dress. By Justinian's time this had been replaced by the tunica, or long chilton, for both sexes, over which the upper classes wore other garments, like a dalmatica, a heavier and shorter type of tunica, again worn by both sexes, but mainly by men. The hems often curved down to a sharp point. The Scaramangian was a riding coat of Persian origin, opening down the front and normally coming to the mid-thigh. Although these are recorded as being worn by emperors, when they seem to become much longer, in general, except for military and presumably riding dress, men of higher status and all women had clothes that came down to the ankles or nearly so. Women often wore a top layer of the stola, for the rich in brocade. All of these, except the stola, might be belted or not. The terms for dress are often confusing, and certain identification of the name a particular pictured item had, or the design that relates to a particular documentary reference, is rare, especially outside the court. The clamis, a semicircular cloak fastened to the right shoulder continued throughout the period. The length fell sometimes only to the hips or as far as the ankles, much longer than the version commonly worn in ancient Greece. The longer version is also called a paludamentum, as well as his courtiers. Emperor Justinian wears one, with a huge brooch, in the Ravenna mosaics. On each straight edge men of the senatorial class had a tablion, a lozenge-shaped colored panel across the chest or midriff, which was also used to show the further rank of the wearer by the color or type of embroidery and jewels used. Theodore Theodosius I and his co-emperors were shown in 388 with theirs at knee level in the Missorium of Theodore Theodosius I at 387. But over the next decades the tablion can be seen to move higher on the clamis, for example in ivories of 413 to 414. A paragouda or border of thick cloth, usually including gold, was also an indicator of rank. Sometimes an oblong cloak would be worn, especially by the military and ordinary people. It was not for court occasions. Cloaks were pinned on the right shoulder for ease of movement, and access to a sword. Leggings and hose were often worn, but are not prominent in depictions of the wealthy. They were associated with barbarians, whether European or Persian. Even basic clothes appear to have been surprisingly expensive for the poor. Some manual workers, probably slaves, are shown continuing to wear, at least in summer, the basic Roman slip costume which was effectively two rectangles sewn together at the shoulders and below the arm. Others, when engaged in activity, are shown with the sides of their tunic tied up to the waist for ease of movement. Iconographic dress the most common images surviving from the Byzantine period are not relevant as references for actual dress worn in the period. Christ, the Apostles, St. Joseph, St. John the Baptist and some others are nearly always shown wearing formulaic dress of a large hemation, a large rectangular mantle wrapped round the body, over of chilton, or loosely tunic, reaching to the ankles. Sandals are worn on the feet. This costume is not commonly seen in secular contexts, although possibly this is deliberate, to avoid confusing secular with divine subjects. The Theotokos is shown wearing a maphorion, a more shaped mantle with a hood and sometimes a hole at the neck. 
This probably is close to actual typical dress for widows, and for married women when in public. The virgin's underdress may be visible, especially at the sleeves. There are also conventions for Old Testament prophets and other biblical figures. Apart from Christ and the Virgin, much iconographic dress is white or relatively muted in color especially when on walls and in manuscripts, but more brightly colored in icons. Many other figures in biblical scenes, especially if unnamed, are usually depicted wearing contemporary Byzantine clothing, female dress. Modesty was important for all except the very rich, and most women appear almost entirely covered by rather shapeless clothes, which needed to be able to accommodate a full pregnancy. The basic garment in the early empire comes down to the ankles, with a high round collar and tight sleeves to the wrist. The fringes and cuffs might be decorated with embroidery, with a band around the upper arm as well. In the 10th and 11th century a dress with flared sleeves, eventually very full indeed at the wrist, becomes increasingly popular. Before disappearing, working women are shown with the sleeves tied up. In court ladies this may come with a V collar. Belts were normally worn, possibly with belt hooks to support the skirt, they may have been cloth more often than leather, and some tasseled sashes are seen. Neck openings were probably often buttoned, which is hard to see in art, and not described in texts, but must have been needed if only for breastfeeding. Straight down, across, or diagonally are the possible options. The plain linen undergarment was, until the 10th century, not designed to be visible. However at this point a standing collar starts to show above the main dress. Hair is covered by a variety of headcloths and veils, presumably often removed inside the home. Sometimes caps were worn under the veil, and sometimes the cloth is tied in turban style. This may have been done while working, for example the midwives in scenes of the nativity of Jesus in art usually adopt this style. Earlier ones were wrapped in a figure of eight fashion, but by the 11th century circular wrapping, possibly sewn into a fixed position, was adopted. In the 11th and 12th centuries headcloths or veils began to be longer. With footwear, we are on firmer ground, as there are considerable numbers of examples recovered by archaeology from the drier parts of the empire. A great variety of footwear is found, with sandals, slippers and boots to the mid-calf all common in manuscript illustrations and excavated finds, where many are decorated in various ways. The color red, reserved for imperial use in male footwear, is actually by far the most common color for women's shoes. Purses are rarely visible, and seem to have been made of textile matching the dress, or perhaps tucked into the sash. Dancers are shown with special dress including short sleeves or sleeveless dresses, which may or may not have a lighter sleeve from an undergarment below. They have tight wide belts, and their skirts have a flared and differently colored element, probably designed to rise up as they spin in dances. A remark of Anna Comnena about her mother suggests that not showing the arm above the wrist was a special focus of Byzantine modesty, although it is sometimes claimed that the face veil was invented by the Byzantines. Byzantine art does not depict women with veiled faces. Although it commonly depicts women with veiled hair, it is assumed that Byzantine women outside court circles went well wrapped up in public, and were relatively restricted in their movements outside the house. They are rarely depicted in art. The literary sources are not sufficiently clear to distinguish between a head veil and a face veil. Strabo, writing in the first century, alludes to some Persian women veiling their faces. In addition, the early 3rd century Christian writer Tertullian, in his treatise The Veiling of Virgins, ch. 17, describes pagan Arab women as veiling the entire face except the eyes, in the manner of an akab. This shows that some Middle Eastern women veiled their faces long before Islam. Color, as in Roman times. Purple was reserved for the royal family. Other colors in various contexts conveyed information as to class and clerical or government rank. Lower class people wore simple tunics but still had the preference for bright colors found in all Byzantine fashions. 
the Byzantine love for color had its sinister side. The races in the Hippodrome used four teams, red, white, blue and green, and the supporters of these became political factions, taking sides on the great theological issues, which were also political questions, of Arianism, Nestorianism and Monophysitism, and therefore on the imperial claimants who also took sides. Huge riots took place, in the 4th to 6th centuries and mostly in Constantinople, with deaths running into the thousands, between these factions, who naturally dressed in their appropriate colours. In medieval France, there were similar colours wearing political factions, called chaperones. Example, a 14th century mosaic from the Caria Kami or Kora church in Istanbul gives an excellent view of a range of costume from the late period. From the left, there is a soldier on guard, the governor in one of the large hats worn by important officials, a middle-ranking civil servant in a dalmatic with a white border, probably embroidered, over a long tunic which also has a border. Then comes a higher-ranking soldier, carrying a sword on an untied belt or baldric. The Virgin and Saint Joseph are in their normal iconographic dress, and behind Saint Joseph a queue of respectable citizens wait their turn to register. Male hem lengths drop as the status of the person increases. All the exposed legs have hose, and the soldiers and citizens have foot wrappings above, presumably with sandals. The citizens wear dalmatics with a white border around the neck and hem, but not as rich as that of the middle-level official. The other men would perhaps wear hats if not in the presence of the governor. A donor figure in the same church, the Grand Logotha to Theodore Metekites, who ran the legal system and finances of the empire, wears an even larger hat, which he keeps on whilst kneeling before Christ. Hats Many men went bareheaded and, apart from the emperor, they were normally so in votive depictions, which may distort the record we have. In the late Byzantine period a number of extravagantly large hats were worn as uniform by officials. In the 12th century, Emperor Andronikos Komnenos wore a hat shaped like a pyramid, but eccentric dress is one of many things he was criticized for. This was perhaps related to the very elegant hat with a very high domed peak, and a sharply turned up brim coming far forward in an acute triangle to a sharp point. That was drawn by Italian artists when the Emperor John VIII Paleologos went to Florence and the Council of Ferrara in 1438 in the last days of the Empire. Versions of this and other clothes, including many spectacular hats worn by the visitors were carefully drawn by Pisanello and other artists. They passed through copies across Europe for use in Eastern subjects, especially for depictions of the Three Kings or Magian nativity scenes. In 1159 the visiting crusader Prince Reynald of Châtillon wore a tiara-shaped felt cap, embellished in gold. An Iberian wide-brimmed felt hat came into vogue during the 12th century. Especially in the Balkans, small caps with or without fur brims were worn, of the sort later adopted by the Russian Tsars. Shoes Not many shoes are seen clearly in Byzantine art because of the long robes of the rich. Red shoes marked the emperor, blue shoes a sabastocrata, and green shoes a protovestirios. The Ravenna mosaics show the men wearing what may be sandals with white socks and soldiers wear sandals tied around the calf or strips of cloth wrapped round the leg to the calf. These probably went all the way to the toes. Some soldiers, including later imperial portraits in military dress, show boots nearly reaching the knee, red for the emperor. In the imperial regalia of the Holy Roman emperors there are shoes or slippers in Byzantine style made in Palermo before 1220. They are short, only to the ankle, and generously cut to allow many different sizes to be accommodated. They are lavishly decorated with pearls and jewels and gold scroll work on the sides and over the toe of the shoe. More practical footwear was no doubt worn on less formal occasions. Outside laborers would either have sandals or be barefoot. The sandals follow the Roman model of straps over a thick sole. Some examples of the Roman cuculus or military boot are also seen on shepherds. 
military costume. This stayed close to the Roman pattern, especially for officers. A breastplate of armor, under which the bottom of a short tunic appeared as a skirt, often overlaid with a fringe of leather straps. The teruges, similar strips covered the upper arms below round armor shoulder pieces. Boots came to the calf, or sandals were strapped high on the legs. A rather flimsy-looking cloth belt is tied high under the ribs as a badge of rank rather than a practical item. Dress and equipment changed considerably across the period to have the most efficient and effective accoutrements current economics would allow. Other ranks' clothing was largely identical to that of common working men. The manuals recommend tunics and coat no longer than the knee. As an army marches first of all on its feet, the manual writers were more concerned that troops should have good footwear than anything else. This ranged from low lace-up shoes to thigh boots, all to be fitted with a few nails. A headcloth which ranged from a simple cloth coming from below the helmet to something more like a turban, was standard military headgear in the Middle and Late Empire for both common troops and for ceremonial wear by some ranks. They were also worn by women. Imperial costume the distinctive garments of the emperors and empresses were the crown and the heavily jeweled imperial loris or pallium, that developed from the tribi triumphalis, a ceremonial colored version of the Roman toga worn by consuls, and worn by the emperor and empress as a quasi-ecclesiastical garment. It was also worn by the twelve most important officials in the imperial bodyguard, and hence by archangels in icons who were seen as divine bodyguards. In fact it was only normally worn a few times a year, such as on Easter Sunday, but it was very commonly used for depictions in art. The men's version of the loris was a long strip dropping down straight in front to below the waist, and with the portion behind pulled round to the front and hung gracefully over the left arm. The female loris was similar at the front end, but the back end was wider and tucked under a belt after pulling through to the front again. Both male and female versions changed style and diverged in the middle Byzantine period, the female later reverting to the new male style. Apart from jewels and embroidery, small enameled plaques were sewn into the clothes. The dress of Manuel I Comnenus was described as being like a meadow covered with flowers. Generally sleeves were closely fitted to the arm and the outer dress comes to the ankles, and is also rather closely fitted. The sleeves of empresses became extremely wide in the later period. The superhumeral, worn throughout the history of Byzantium, was the imperial decorative collar, often forming part of the loris. It was copied by at least women of the upper class. It was of cloth of gold or similar material, then studded with gems and heavily embroidered. The decoration was generally divided into compartments by vertical lines on the collar. The edges would be done in pearls of varying sizes in up to three rows. There were occasionally drop pearls placed at intervals to add to the richness. The collar came over the collarbone to cover a portion of the upper chest. The imperial regalia of the Holy Roman Emperors, kept in the Schatzkammer, contains a full set of outer garments made in the 12th century in essentially Byzantine style at the Byzantine-founded workshops in Palermo. These are among the best surviving Byzantine garments and give a good idea of the lavishness of imperial ceremonial clothing. There is a cloak, alb, dalmatic, stockings, slippers and gloves. The loris is Italian in later. Each element of the design on the cloak is outlined in pearls and embroidered in gold. Especially in the early and later periods emperors may be shown in military dress with gold breastplates, red boots, and a crown. Crowns had pendilia and became closed on top during the 12th century. Court dress Court life passed in a sort of ballet, with precise ceremonies prescribed for every occasion, to show that imperial power could be exercised in harmony and order, and the empire could thus reflect the motion of the universe as it was made by the creator, according to the emperor Constantine Porphyrogenitus. 
who wrote a book of ceremonies describing in enormous detail the annual round of the court, special forms of dress for many classes of people on particular occasions are set down, at the name day dinner for the emperor or empress various groups of high officials performed ceremonial dances. One group wearing a blue and white garment, with short sleeves and gold bands, and rings on their ankles. In their hands they hold what are called fingia. The second group do just the same, but wearing a garment of green and red, split, with gold bands. These colors were the marks of the old chariot racing factions, the four now merged to just the blues and the greens and incorporated into the official hierarchy. According to Pseudo-Codinos, the distinctive color of the Sebastocrata was blue. His ceremonial costume included blue shoes embroidered with eagles on a red field, a red tunic, and a diadem in red and gold. As in the Versailles of Louis XIV, elaborate dress and court ritual probably were at least partly an attempt to smother and distract from political tensions. However this ceremonial way of life came under stress as the military crisis deepened, and never revived after the interlude of the Western emperors following the capture of Constantinople by the Fourth Crusade in 1204. In the late period a French visitor was shocked to see the empress riding in the street with fewer attendants and less ceremony than a Queen of France would have had.